Uh, for those of you who know me, you'll know that 20 years ago, I spent much, 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 much quicker, um, which would drive everyone crazy. I try and speak more slowly now, but I don't always succeed. So thank you for that reminder. Um, I wanted to start off with greetings from Canada. Um, this is my home city of Ottawa. I'm not there at the moment, but this is where I would normally plan to be. This is pre-COVID. Um, we have a, in Canada, we celebrate Canada Day on the 1st of July, and that tens of thousands of citizens come out by our Houses of Parliament and have a big party. Um, this year, we couldn't do that, uh, but hopefully in future years, we will be able to. So um, I want to give a really sort of fairly basic discuss, uh, talk about audit and feedback. And um, we've got other people who will give a, a, a much deeper uh, uh, um, discussion uh, in other webinars in the future. But audit and feedback is one of the commonest quality improvement approaches used globally. And it's likely that its use is only going to increase given we increasingly have good data from electronic health records and administered data. The, um, uh, so audit involves measuring the quality of care against standards of practice and we can collect data either through chart audits, through electronic health records, through patient surveys or through routine administered data. And I noticed from the questions from some of the uh, projects, uh, you are thinking about how best to do this and how you do the audit side of this uh, most efficiently. But once we've collected that data, the feedback uh, part is by providing a report on performance to relevant healthcare professionals, administrators or organizations with the purpose of promoting change. So trying to encourage people to, uh, uh, or give it, telling them how they're performing and hoping they will, if they're not uh, performing as well as we'd like, that they will then think about how they can change the care they provide. And there are many, uh, um, other words that are used to describe audit and feedback, including benchmarks, practice profiles, report cards, dashboards, but all of these are fundamentally audit and feedback exercises. And here's an example of some audit and feedback we gave in Scotland uh, uh, many years ago, where we're trying to use audit and feedback to reduce inappropriate lab testing by family practitioners. So we collected data from the, uh, uh, from, the uh, or from the laboratory information system. And uh, in the graph, what we have done is we have charted uh, basically how many tests per uh, 10,000 patients a uh, uh, practice would, um, uh, 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 would uh, 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 record or request and, and shown how this changed over time. And we also compare that to what the Grampian average is, what the regional average is. And what you can see is that, yeah, there's maybe a slight increase over time. Um, but yeah, this practice was very similar to what was happening in the region as a whole. But alongside um, the uh, audit and feedback, we gave an educational message where we said, in general, FSH testing is of limited value in the assessment of menopausal status in women over 40 years, it should, so should not be requested for this purpose. So we showed how this practice performed against the average in the region, but we also sort of said, yeah, but the average in the region isn't very good. The actual graph should be much lower down here as a way of trying to stimulate change and um, 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 get people to think about uh, whether they really needed to order a, an FSH test uh, uh, when they were looking after women who were perimenopausal. And in this trial, which was published in The Lancet, we demonstrated about a 15% reduction across a wide range of tests um, by providing feedback with these educational messages alongside it. So why do we think, or how do we think audit and feedback works? Well, it, it actually is a fairly fundamental human um, character or, or human uh, uh, um, activity. Um, as human beings, we have a set of goals about how we want to live our lives, how we want to be perceived by others. So in general, healthcare professionals want to provide the best care for their patients. If I am doing a, 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 a normally a, 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 a lecture, one of my goals is to make sure that people in the lecture hall don't fall asleep while I'm talking. So we have a goal 
and then we are constantly uh, and we've got, uh, we constantly sort of are trying to get input from our environment about whether we are reaching our goal so we want to compare our goal with the current behavior and see if there's any discrepancy so if i'm giving a lecture i look to people in the audience and if people's heads start nodding and their eyes start closing it's normally roberto grilli because he's getting very old um, but he normally starts to nod off in the first five minutes of any lecture i give um, but I will start to be, uh, I'll start to think about what I can do to sort of uh, wake people up. So I might wave my arms around, I might raise my voice or give a sort of a, or tell a joke to try and get people's attention. So we have a goal, we then try and see how we're doing that against that in, our, in the real world. And what we might find is that actually everyone's awake, everyone is happy, that is great, I don't have to do anything. Uh, we might decide actually, well, maybe you know, Roberto Grilli always falls asleep in, a, in the lecture hall. So maybe I don't mind having you know, 90, as long as 95% of people in the lecture hall are awake, then I don't have to worry and I'll just discount Roberto Grilli. Or I may say, oh, it's just too hard to do this. So yeah, I'm going to give up. I'm not even going to try and keep people awake um, uh, 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 through this lecture. I'm just going to get through it as quickly as I can and try and move out of that. But what we hope, I mean, those are all ways that don't particularly lead to, to change. What we hope is that people think about this and think about, I need to do something differently. So they need to change their behavior to reduce the discrepancy between their goals and what they're actually achieving. And once we do that, once we try and make a change uh, uh, um, to that, we can then monitor how we're doing and then again, you know, see how we're doing against our comparators. So, you know, when I started waving my hands about, um, you know, most people in the audience woke up, that's great, I don't have to do very much more, or actually I really had no effect on that. I have to think about something else about engaging the audience. So that's how we think audit and feedback works and it's a pretty fundamental human aspect of human behavior one of the challenges for healthcare professionals is they are it's often hard for them to get a sense about how good their current performance is we don't have you know we don't see our mistakes and uh, we often don't recognize those patients who maybe get lost to follow-up and so although we think we're doing really good care for patients uh, uh, for follow-up patients we're missing 30 percent of the population we're interested in and in fact, there was a very interesting systematic review done by uh, um, American and US colleagues now um, uh, um, 20 years ago, which showed uh, if you looked at what healthcare professionals said they did and then looked at their performance, um, in general, they were overestimating their performance so that they, uh, uh, they, would notice, uh, they, they thought that they were performing 27% better than uh, they actually were. So if I have a goal that I want to be a really good doctor, I want to make sure 90% of my patients after a heart attack are taking preventive medication, um, and really I'm only achieving 63%, I might internally think, well, I'm doing okay, because I might assume that I'm getting up to, to 90%. So audience feedback helps address this issue that we overestimate our performance. And again, this overestimation of performance is something that is inherently human. Um, there are no, you know, if I ask people on the call, who is a below average driver, we'd all say we're above average drivers. Um, so that we're not very good at, so it's one of the ways we get through life is by having a better view of ourselves than we probably are. Um, and so when physicians and nurses and pharmacists go into their clinical practice, they just behave like human beings. And so again, they will overestimate how they think um, or, or how well they think they do. Um, so this theory of audit and feedback makes some assumptions. The first is that the audit and feedback is salient and actionable. In other words, we're giving feedback on things that are important for the healthcare professionals. If we give feedback on things that aren't relevant to them, they'll ignore it. It's not part of my goals. Why should I worry about um, that aspect? And also that it's actionable. I can do something about it. Giving me feedback on something I can't change is just going to make me frustrated. It also assumes that health professionals are motivated to undertake the targeted behavior. 
but in general they are one of the kind of the reasons people become healthcare professionals is because they want to provide the best care possible for their patients so normally motivation is not a major issue for healthcare professionals as uh, you know, next assumption is that those people undertaking clinical care actually receive the feedback Sometimes when we give feedback at the organizational level, it never gets down to the surgeons or the pharmacists or the nurses who are providing the care to the patients on the floor. It's also important that the healthcare professionals trust the data collection and analysis process so that they, uh, you know, so they don't sort of uh, immediately reject the feedback by saying the data are poor quality and all my patients are different. So there's a number of assumptions built in and audit feedback will not work under all circumstances if um, these assumptions are not met. So we need to think about these things when we're asking the question, could audit feedback be helpful for us? So the next question is, does audit feedback improve practice? And actually here we have a very, very strong evidence base. So a colleague, Noah Ivers, undertook the Co uh, Cochrane Review in 2012 and we identified 140 trials of audit feedback published before 2010. And we found the median absolute improvement was about a 4%. So in other words, if we were um, at 63% uh, uh, um, in terms of our baseline performance and compliance with guidelines, after audit feedback, the average improvement would take us up to about 67%. Now that may not sound like a lot, but on a population level, that can have very important um, effects for population outcomes and patients. But probably more important is there's a wide variation in the effects of audit feedback. So the interquartile range went from 1% to 16%. So in other words, in more than 25% or in 25% of the studies, there's a 16% or greater absolute improvement in performance and we could start to work out when would audit and feedback be more effective and it seemed that audit and feedback would be larger if baseline compliance was low if you were maybe at 30 percent of the standard rather than 80 percent of the standard if the source was a supervisor or colleague rather than external agency or research group if it was provided more than once if it was delivered in both verbal and written formats and if it included both explicit targets and an action plan, these are ways of helping people actually develop their change plans uh, and it increases likelihood that they actually do uh, um, make change plans. But one of the things we observed, this was a cumulative analysis that um, over, the, over probably about 15 years, our knowledge about how to improve uh, or, or use audit feedback to improve care hadn't really changed that as we added new trials into the mix we found that we still were getting about the same median and the same interquartile range and this kind of concerned us because it felt like um, to quote uh, Noah again we had a growing literature of stagnant science and so what we've done since the kind of the Cochrane review is uh, with a group of international colleagues we've been thinking about how do we understand why we have this variation in response and can that help us think about how we can predictively increase the likelihood that audit and feedback will be effective. So um, the next webinar in this series is going to be led by my colleague Jamie Breho and one of the things he did is he's, he went and interviewed 30 world experts in feedback from across a wide range of disciplines. So as well as healthcare, we had social sciences, organizational sciences, and he asked this group, how could we make the audit feedback that we typically give in healthcare more effective? And they came up with a very long list. They came up with 300 specific suggestions about how to improve audit feedback. But when we were thinking about this, we identified 15 low hanging fruit, 15 things that we thought that if uh, people did that designing feedback, were using it would already increase their likelihood of success and Jamie will go through these in much more detail but these were the 15 suggestions um, provide feedback more than once that comes from the Cochrane review provide, provide, uh, present feedback as soon as possible one of the projects talks about the challenge of collecting data and the gap between when data are collected and feedback can be given 
provide individual rather than general data. So if you can get down to the physician or the ward, it's better than get, getting to the, the hospital. And so you can see these are a set of principles that we could start to use when we are um, designing our audit feedback. And for some of these, we have good empirical evidence, and for others, we have a strong theoretical rationale about why they may be important. So for those of you who are designing feedback, yeah, I would use this as a check as a checklist or an aid memoir to think about you know, how do we do this well. One of the key issues that I often find is that people make audit and feedback very complicated. And what we have here is that one of the ideas is minimize cognitive load, make it easier for the healthcare professionals to recognize very quickly how their perform what their performance is. So often more simpler graphic presentations are better than very, very complex graphics or dashboards that will take people you know, um, uh, uh, minutes to understand. Uh, my rule of thumb is if I can't look at a graph and in five seconds know whether I'm doing well or not, then it's not a good presentation. So these are things that are very practical that you can start to think about using now. Um, other colleagues, uh, these are, this is um, led by uh, Ben Brown, who's a, uh, um, a family doc in the UK. Uh, they went and they reviewed all of the qualitative evidence in relation to uh, audit and feedback and came up with uh, uh, the clinical performance feedback intervention theory, CPFIT. I'm not going to talk about that, but that's again something you might want to look at because for some of the questions that the different projects have identified, there's some suggestions in Ben's paper about you know, what you might be able to do to address some of those. So we started off knowing that in general audit and feedback works, we understand why it might work, we also understand that um, there's a wide variation in the effects we see and we're starting to identify things that uh, we think will increase the effectiveness but we'd also like to try and test those so that as we are moving forward, we are cumulatively building the science to improve um, uh, the care that's uh, uh, or, or the effectiveness of audit and feedback. So this has led us to uh, the idea of um, uh, creating implementation laboratories and also a meta laboratory. So um, implementation laboratories include research teams, that are integrated into healthcare systems that are undertaking programs of research that are directly relevant to the healthcare system's priorities. So when we did the work on lab testing in Scotland uh, uh, 20 years ago, we were working with the head of the lab who had identified you know, the nine tests we were working with as things that would make a big difference to the lab if we could change them. Um, when you start to work together this way, there are opportunities for formal and informal linkages between uh, uh, and the research team and the healthcare system, and a lot of really rich learning um, from both sides because the people in the healthcare system who are delivering audit feedback have a lot of really important tacit knowledge and practical experience that researchers often don't understand, but researchers also can you know, bring some of this depth of knowledge that uh, comes from the research world. And where we'd like to get to is if we're working with a, a, a healthcare organization, let's say they've created their audit feedback, and we call that standard audit feedback, we basically sort of um, 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 suggest to them that they might want to randomize uh, um, the, the people getting audit feedback to variations of audit feedback. So the standard audit feedback becomes audit feedback A and we test it against audit and feedback B, which might be, say, a change in how we graphically represent the data, a change in the comparator, or the frequency of the audit and feedback. We find that B is better. So B becomes a standard of care for the organization, and then we test B against C. We find C is now better, or it may be more costly. Well, we'll stick with B, and then we can tie B against D. So the idea here is that for the organization, they're constantly improving how and they're, they're delivering audit feedback, but we're also generating robust evidence about uh, how um, uh, or what factors after Jamie's 15 or Ben's 59 um, are important for us to take into account. And so we now have a number of these implementation laboratories around the world. So in Canada, the Netherlands, the UK, uh, the US, there's interest in Australia. 
Um, and they are all sort of basically um, trying to develop this programmatic approach of working with the healthcare system to test audit feedback uh, variants to more rapidly uh, uh, improve the knowledge base. Um, and what we then created is a meta laboratory. So um, all of these uh, individuals based in these sort of uh, 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 these um, um, laboratories, yeah, we try and come together at least once a year face to face to discuss what we've learned what we think the next steps are. And normally when we are doing that, we also have a, 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 a separate day where we really work with the health system partners in terms of how they can improve their audit and feedback. And the Meta Laboratory now has around about um, uh, 50 to 60 members internationally who are spending a lot of their time thinking and working on audit and feedback. And so what we would hope is the work that we're doing there will be of value to the people in EasyNet. And we're very keen to find ways in which our work can help you. So the Meta Lab is a, shared, uh, is a global community of science and practice to help share learning across studies and laboratories, to share expertise. We have some really uh, strong people on user-centered design, on uh, uh, behaviorally optimizing feedback, on statistics. Um, it allows us the opportunity to try and plan replication to look at replicability across studies and contexts. And it also is helping build an international community of healthcare system organizations. So that for example, the people in the natural prescribing service in, the, in Australia know uh, who are the, the equivalent people in the UK uh, and it, it facilitates communication between them. So the last few slides here, we have a website and it's got lots of resources on it. I'd encourage you to um, go and have a look at it. Uh, we have a listserv, so if you want, anybody wants to join the listserv, if you email, I'll give you an email address at the end of the call, we can put you on the listserv, which will mean that you'll get early notice of anything going on. We have a Twitter feed. We are currently doing a, a, a webinar series um, uh, once a month. Because we couldn't meet face-to-face -face this year, we're actually having a monthly webinar series. Uh, the number of the, the first two are archived on, our, um, uh, on, the, on the MetaLab website. But the next uh, one is going to be next Thursday at 9 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. So that will be um, uh, 3 p.m. your time, I think. Um, you need to check that. But these are open to anybody. And we're actually doing this webinar, particularly with choosing, or in partnership with Choosing Wisely Canada. And it's going to focus on using audit feedback um, to uh, uh, improve antibiotic stewardship in primary care. And I know there are colleagues in, in Italy who are interested in that area. And I'll give you the URL at the end of the talk that you can register. So the last sort of the summary slide is that um, audit and feedback is an effective way to change professional behavior and to improve the quality of care. Uh, there's still substantial uncertainty about how we best optimize audit and feedback to maximize its effects, but I think there are opportunities for new collaborative partnerships between uh, researchers and healthcare organizations and across um, yeah, implementation laboratories to really try and more rapidly improve the scientific basis of audit and feedback and to increase the likelihood that it actually makes a difference in uh, real world settings. So the next EasyNet webinar is um, by my handsome colleague, uh, Dr. Jamie Briho, and he will talk through in more detail uh, these 15 ways uh, to optimize feedback. And um, uh, uh, I, I think that will be highly helpful for those of you who are, who are working on this at the moment in Italy. And just the last slide is the various uh, audio feedback Meta Lab resources. Um, so if you want to learn more about us, if you contact Steph Link later, Narina will be able to circulate these later. You can follow us on Twitter. Uh, you can um, um, you know, go to the website. Uh, here's the webinar series, and here's the URL for um, registering for the, uh, uh, the next webinar on antibiotic stewardship. Um, but you can get to the, the, this link through, the, through our website and the, the webinar series tab there. So that's all I had to say. Um, I hope I was uh, not too uh, garbled, and I apologize if I was. Um, I know how hard it is to follow uh, um, uh, 
uh, uh, presentations in other languages um, and how taxing that is. So um, uh, hopefully, uh, maybe next year, maybe the year after, um, I'll be able to get to um, uh, come and spend time in Rome or uh, uh, um, uh, Bologna or somewhere else with you all and learn what's going on. So I'll pause there.